Esther 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, that is the Ahasuerus that reigned from India even to Ethiopia, over a hundred and twenty-seven provinces, in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the fortress, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast to all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and the princes of the provinces being before him, when he showed the glorious wealth of his kingdom and the splendid magnificence of his grandeur. Many days, a hundred and eighty days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast to all the people that were present in Shushan, the fortress, both to great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. White, green, and blue hangings were fastened with cords of byssus and purple to silver rings and pillars of white marble. Couches of gold and silver lay upon a pavement of red and white marble. <clears throat> and they gave drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the king's bounty. And the drinking was according to the commandment without constraint. For so the king had appointed to all the magnates of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also the queen Vashti made a feast for the women of the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the king's heart was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Vista, Herbona, Victa, and Abacta, Zitor, and Carcass, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Vashti, the queen, before the king with the royal crown to show the peoples and the princes her beauty. For she was a beauty, she was of beautiful countenance. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the word of the king which was sent by the chamberlains. And the king was very wroth, and his fury burned in him. And the king said to the wise man who knew the times, for so was the king's business conducted before all that knew law and judgment, and the next to him were Kushina, Shitar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, Marcina, and Memukan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, who saw the king's face and who said first in the king, What shall be done to the queen Vashti according to law, because she has not performed the word of the king Ahasuerus by the Chamberlain? <coughs> then said Memukan before the king and the princes, The queen Vashti has not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king Ahasuerus. For the act of the queen will come abroad to all women, so as to render their husbands contemptible in their eyes, when they shall say the king Ahasuerus commanded the queen Vashti to be brought in before him, and she came not. And the princesses of Persia and Media, who have heard of the queen's act, will say this day to all the king's princes, and there will be contempt and anger enough. If it please the king, let the royal order go forth from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it may not pass that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate to another that is better than she. And when the king's edict, which he shall make, shall be heard throughout his realm, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor from the greatest to the least. And the same pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mukan. And he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province according to the writing thereof, and to every people according to their language, that every man should be their rule in his own house, and should speak according to the language of his people. So far the reading of the scripture. Now it's not easy to speak on a book like this. And we should keep in mind, when we read the scriptures, especially the Old Testament, three principles, three golden rules. The first one is to try to understand what a text says literally. And as somebody has said, when you read what has been written, you accept what has been written, you really have what is written. And then secondly, we have a principle in the New Testament, or many uh, passages which refer to that principle, 
that says that the Old Testament really has been written for us, on our behalf. That means that the Church of the Living God, the Assembly, is a people which is so precious for God that He even directed the events of the Old Testament in a special way in view of us, to instruct us. You may read that in 1 Corinthians 10 and other places, Romans 15, uh, also a verse in chapter 9 of 1 Corinthians and many other passages. And most of all, as we have said in our prayer and also sung in our hymn, the scriptures speak of our Lord Jesus. We might say there is no page where you cannot find back the Lord Jesus. And even when we take a book like this, which is so difficult, apparently, on the, out, on the outward at least, to find something of the Lord Jesus, with the Lord's help we may find something of him. And the third principle is that these scriptures often deal with Israel in the past and also in the future. So what we hope to see is that this book, Esther, has a special meaning for the remnant in the past and the future remnant of Israel, of the Jews. And then it has a special application for you and me. I hope to come back on that. Now first, to place, as it were, this book, it has to do with King Ahasuerus, who belonged to the Medes and the Persians. He was himself a Persian, but his kingdom was the second world empire. Now what does that mean? You remember that God had given to his people Israel the land of Canaan. And when the nation of Israel entered that land, we read in Joshua 3 that the God of the earth, of the whole earth, went before them to introduce them into that land. And so we see that it was God's people who took possession of that land, and we see that God was reigning in, among them and also through them. We know from other scriptures, like Deuteronomy 32, that Israel actually is the center of all the nations. And when God called Abraham from um, the Chaldeans, from Ur of the, Ur of the Chaldeans, we see that God wanted to bless Abraham and that in him all the nations of the earth, would be, all the families even of the earth would be blessed. That goes very far. So we see Israel as called through, seen in Abraham, would have a key place in history, but also in man, in, in, in the history of uh, the human race, and also in the future, Israel will have this key position. And we read then, in the days of Solomon, that Solomon was seated on the throne of the Lord, the throne of Jehovah. So that means Solomon was the direct representative of God. God reigned through him. But you know what happened? Israel has been unfaithful. And after many warnings, God left them. You know what happened? We read it in Ezekiel 9, 10, 11. The glory of the Lord departed from the temple, departed from Jerusalem, from the land. The glory of God went away. That was the first thing. And then we see that God gave this nation over into the hands of their enemies. God had allowed already that the ten tribes were scattered among the Assyrians because of their idolatry. But now the two tribes and the Levites were, were among them because of their unfaithfulness, they were brought into captivity. They had introduced idolatry. God said, you can read it in Zechariah 5, I will bring you back to the root of idolatry, to the source of idolatry, the origin of idolatry, Babel. Babylon, as we know, was really the starting point of idolatry, Genesis 10 and 11. And so they were brought back there. And not only that, God gave them the authority over the, over the nations, over the whole world, into the hands of the head of the nations, Nebuchadnezzar. You read it in Daniel, in the book of Daniel. You see how God gave him the authority in Daniel 3, in a special way you see it, in the statue in Daniel 2 already, but also in chapter 3 and 4 we see how God had conferred this authority now into the hands of the head of the nations. And so God did this. It's not that he usurped this authority, he received this authority from the hands of God. 
But you know, Nebuchadnezzar was unfaithful. You see it in Daniel 4, very clearly. Three, three already, also in 4. His descendants were unfaithful. And God, after approximately 70 years, he allowed the Medes and the Pers Persians to take over this empire. We are here in the times of the Gentiles. And even that is very practical for us because we are still living in the days, in those days which belong to the times of the Gentiles, where God has conferred authority to the Gentiles. And so we see that Ahasuerus had received this authority from God. And later on, the Third Empire, Alexander the Great and his generals later on, later on you see the Romans. And even when Paul was writing Romans 13, it was under Nero. Nero was a dictator. He was living as a beast. But he had authority received from God. He abused that. That's true. But it was God's authority. And so Paul recognizes it, acknowledges this, and accepts this. And so we are instructed in Romans 13. Now, we see here that Ahasuerus has received this authority from God. And we hope to see then that the position he had, in the position he had, he represents God. And there's a very important key to understand this book. That Ahasuerus, according to the position God had given him, he represents God. That doesn't mean that as a man he represented God really in what he did. But according to his position, he received from God the authority God had given him. As such, he represented God. And it was in that sense God's throne. As you have seen, Solomon was seated on God's throne. He was, his descendants were unfaithful. He himself was already unfaithful. So God conferred this authority to the hands, into the hands of the head of the nations. Before we go uh, on, I'd like to give, with the Lord's help, a little introduction to see some of the line, the great principles in this book. One of the principles is this, that God views history in relation to his people. This morning we have read a few verses in Genesis 14. Genesis 14 mentions the first war. Of course, there have been many wars before, but they are not recorded in the Bible. The Bible is not a history book. Although when the Bible speaks about history, it is it's sure, it's certain, and it is without fault and mistake. But God writes there about a war. Why? Because some of his people were involved in it. Lot! Although Lot was unfaithful, as you know. God wrote this chapter because it happened to Lot. And then also Abraham was involved. And this is an important principle for us to understand. Why does God give certain details in history? It's only because his people is involved. And you know, when you read the book of Esther and you compare it with uh, the history books we have at school, we don't find in Esther 1 that Ahasuerus was preparing for a big war against the Greeks. We don't find it. But these days we have been reading of, these 180 days were actually days he was preparing his army for an attack against the Greeks. But it is not mentioned. Uh, in chapter 2, in his seventh year, that is after that war, he is back then in his place where he reigned. You know, in between, this war had taken place, and Ahasuerus had lost this battle. There was a big defeat, and so Europe was not uh, taken by these Persians. The Persians, they wanted to attack the, Greek, the Greeks and then take possession to enlarge their empire. But God didn't allow it. And so the Persians did not enter Europe. All these things are not mentioned in this book. But we should realize when God gives history, it is in connection with his people. And then we should see also that when his people get involved, and we see it in Esther later on, how God writes history, because his people is taken. And so that is the whole reason why we have the book of Esther. Not because of this war against the Greeks, but because of the attack of Haman against God's people. That's the reason why we have this book. And also to see how God would protect his people. I hope to come back on that point. Just 
another scripture, I've mentioned Genesis 14, but I'm thinking of Daniel 10. In Daniel 10, we see how behind these powers, the prince of uh, Greece and the prince of uh, the Persians, the Medians, there were demon powers, authorities, as we have in Ephesians 6. These demon powers, they were behind these leaders. They were behind the king Ahasuerus, which is, who is called as, who is known as Xerxes in history. He was also behind Alexander the Great, you know. And so, what was really going on is not a battle between these nations. What was essentially going on is a battle against God's people. And so it is today. We might think there is a conflict between Russia and the Americans. And you might mention many other conflicts. But what is the real conflict? The real conflict is between God and Satan. And so we will see it in the future. And the prophetic events will take place. The real conflict through these nations is against God's people. And so when we speak about that, we should realize that in those days it was against God's earthly people. And that is still the case today. Although the nation of Israel is still low am I, not my people, in God's providence he has protected them. And the enemy is attacking them. And it is against God's heavenly people. God's people, when we are faithful, heavenly people, we will be attacked, we will be persecuted, as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, another passage. So that's the real battle. The real conflict is between the powers of darkness against the powers of light. And we hope to see that in this book. And you know, we need much patience because in one evening we cannot speak about the whole book, but we try to find certain main principles and we hope to develop them in the course of the book. In connection with this, we see that God's people really is a little remnant. God speaks about them and he cares for them. It's a little remnant. And this little remnant is so precious for him. Although the nation as such was rejected by God, he had no official relationship anymore with this nation as such. There was a little remnant. And now we see this remnant in different ways. We see this remnant in Ezra and Nehemiah. There they were back in Jerusalem. And there God could identify himself with them. Although they were feeble and weak, God identified himself with them. And so it is today. With a feeble remnant, the Lord may identify himself. He may protect them. But you know, those who remained in Babylon after the edict of Cyrus, that they could go back to Jerusalem, those who remained in Babylon, we don't see that God could identify himself publicly with them. And the proof for this we find there is no mention of the name of God in this book. No mention of the name of God. That is significant. There is no prayer recorded. There is no altar like they had in Jerusalem. There is no temple like they rebuilt in Jerusalem. There is no priest. There is no service for God. Because publicly, you know, God could not identify himself with those who remain in Babylon. He did in the days of Daniel and so on. But now they could go back to Jerusalem. And those who didn't, God could not identify himself with them publicly. And that's the reason why I said there are no prayer, the name of God is not mentioned, and many other details on these lines. But God takes care of them in his providence. We see that God protects his people. And we see that God is behind the scenes. When you would, when you would like to have one book in the Bible, to see clearly how God is acting to protect his people. You see it in this book, although his name is not mentioned. You see from the beginning till the end how God is behind the scenes and how God is in control. Uh, the moment, to give an example, Haman wanted to s destroy this nation, God allowed that it took 12 months that he decided that the lot, we hope to see that in chapter 3, fell for the 12 months. So there was a period of 12 months in between before this edict could be carried out. We see the moment that uh, the king, to give another example, could not sleep. The servants read just a portion in connection with Mordecai. And at that moment, Haman was there in the court. And so you could go on and give many details where we see 
God's providential dealings with his people. How in every detail God was directing. And how encouraging this is for us also today. You know, when we read these scriptures, we have three perspectives before us. We have the his historical account. It's important to take note of that and to study carefully. But then we see the application for us, many practical lessons. And we see the prophetic meaning of it in connection with the future remnant. These three perspectives are always before us. So we try to not to confuse you, but let us keep that in mind. That we sometimes speak of Israel in the past, sometimes of the future remnant, and sometimes the applications for us. So this book shows very clearly, although the name of God is not mentioned, that he is in control. We hope to see that in more details. Now as to the ex exegesis, the, really, the real application of the book, uh, ex excuse me, the real meaning of the book is in connection with his faithful realm. And we hope to see that in chapter 2. There it starts really. There his faithful remnant will be introduced. But before we come there, I'd like just to give uh, a short outline of it. Why is this book called the Book of Esther? Because she is really, she belongs to that faithful remnant. She, in her, really, this, this remnant is represented. And we hope to see that it is in God's heart to have again this relationship with his old people. Israel had been set aside as we have seen but God loves this nation and he wants to have them for himself but he cannot have embraces for an unfaithful nation he only can accept those who are faithful those who have certain qualities and conditions as we have as we will see in Esther 2 and so what we see here in this book is how this relationship between Esther and Ahasuerus is established. When we keep in mind that Ahasuerus is representing God, as I said, his position is in his position he represents God. He is on the throne of God in that sense. He really represents God. And so we see how Esther is brought into a relationship with the king. And so the future remnant will be brought into a relationship with God himself. But that is not all. We will see also how this remnant will be a blessing for the Messiah. And in Mordecai, we will find a picture of the Messiah, of the Lord Jesus. We will find wonderful traits, wonderful features in Mordecai, which speak about our Lord Jesus, about his sufferings, about his faithfulness, about his glory, present glory, and about his future glory here on earth, chapter 10. So that is uh, one of the lines we see, on the one hand, a re-establishment of the relationship between this future remnant and God. And also how this remnant will have a function in connection with the Messiah. In other books, we find how this remnant is brought into a relationship with the Messiah himself. And that's what we have in the, in the book, in the Song of Songs. We were studying this morning. There we find how this remnant present uh, seen in Jerusalem called the bride really in the Old Testament representing the Jews but especially this faithful remnant among the Jews how they will be brought into a relationship with the Messiah in the days when he will still be rejected and the Song of Songs speak of that they will know the Messiah they will love him they will follow him like we have in Revelation 14 they follow the Lamb where, whithersoever he goes that is a real relationship of love during the days that the Messiah will still be rejected. Now you see the application for us. We belong to the Beloved in the days he is rejected here on earth. So there are many lines which uh, may be applied to us. The same with Esther. Esther is a faithful remnant brought into a relationship with God. Now that's what God wants for us. He wants to have a faithful remnant in these days of almost apostasy. We have in Revelation 3 that picture of a remnant, which is so precious for the heart of the Lord Jesus, but also for the heart of God. The Lord speaks of my God there. There's another book in the Old Testament, Ruth, where we find again this relationship between a poor bride who had no merits. She merited nothing. She was even a Moabite. But it speaks of 
Israel in the future, the future remnant, presented there as a Moabite, shows that she has no rights, absolutely no rights. That is one of the things we find there. But she is brought into a relationship of love with Boaz, which speaks of the, who speaks about the Lord Jesus. So these three books, Esther, um, Ruth, and Song of Songs, speak of this future remnant, and in the application we may apply to us, and it speaks how God wants to introduce them into a living relationship with Him, and into a relationship with the Messiah, as we have in Ruth and in Song of Songs. And so in this book, it is not a marriage between Esther and Mordecai. Here it is a marriage between Ahasuerus, representing God, and Esther. We have to distinguish these different lines. But at the same time, we see how this book is given to glorify Mordecai, to make great Mordecai. And we hope to see that clearly in connection with the Lord Jesus. So when we speak of history, we should realize that God thinks of his people. This way we should also study our history books. We should, when we read Luke 2 and 3, for example, we see a marvelous example of the same principle. There was the mighty king in, in Rome, uh, Augustus, August, Caesar Augustus. He gave a decree. Why? That the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. He didn't realize that. There we see how God used this decree of such a mighty man and how God moved his heart to do just his will. And the same principle we find times and again, also in this book. When we start now with verse 1, we may uh, refer to Daniel uh, 11, the verse in Daniel 11, where we find how this king is mentioned there. In Daniel 11, verse 2, And now will I declare unto thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall enrich himself with great riches more than all. Now this is the king of our uh, chapter we have read. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. Now that is what we have here in Esther 1. He had become very rich. He had 127 provinces, even seven more than the king uh, Darius had in Daniel 6. He was here at the really at the climax of his power. And he mobilized now everything against Greece, the king of, the, of Greece. And this is what took place in these days here, in the 180 days of the third year of his reign, he was preparing himself for that war. We find then in verse 4 uh, that during the, those days he showed the glory and wealth of his kingdom and the splendid magnificence of his grandeur many days, 180 days. Now, to understand this, what this means, when we see that this king represents God, really, in connection also with the first creation. I'm not speaking now about the second creation, the new creation we belong to, but we belong also to the first creation. And we see in this book, the last historical book of the Old Testament, how God wants to bless his people, and how God wants <coughs> to bless the whole creation. And God is going to do this in the millennium. You know, <coughs> the first book of the Bible, the first historical book, is the book of Genesis, and it has been much attacked by the enemy. But it speaks of God who wants to bless his people. It speaks also about the one who God wants to introduce. We see it in Adam in Genesis 1. We see it in Joseph at the end of Genesis, how God wants to use all these earthly things belong to the first creation to bless his people. And so we see in the millennium that God will use the blessing of this first creation under the leadership of the Lord Jesus so that all nations will be blessed and his earthly people will be blessed. We see also in the book of Genesis that uh, the king uh, Pharaoh was really the same as representing God, as Ahasuerus here the last historical book of the Bible. So that is really not something new, that a king would represent God. Pharaoh, in Genesis, represents God as well. And we see that Joseph receives a place at his right hand. So it is in this book. Ahasuerus represents God, and Mordecai will receive a place at his right hand in Esther 10. We see also that it is God's desire to bless his people. 
And now the application for us. Because, you know, all these blessings, these earthly blessings, which belong to the first creation, they may be enjoyed by us. That does not mean that we have nothing else. Of course, we have higher blessings, but we should also appreciate the earthly blessings we receive from God's hands. And I would suggest that only Christians, really, may appreciate these earthly blessings God has given them. We see that people in the world, they use these blessings for their own glory and for the glory of Satan. But we are those who may receive these blessings and use them for God's glory. And this is the principle we find here in chapter 1. We should understand then that these things speak of the first creation which goes on till the end of the millennium. And then the Lord will reign. He is the heir of all things, as you have already in Hebrews 1. And he will then be the crown upon God's creation, as we have in Esther 10 and as we have in the millennium. Really, the millennium is important to understand. When people reject that uh, truth, you know, it's morally really impossible to accept this. Because that would mean that the first creation would never be for the glory of God. Because from the fall and onward, the first creation has never been for the glory of God. But God is going to have the first creation for his own glory and for the blessing of his people. And we profit from these things already now. Although we are not yet in the millennium, we are under God and under the Lord Jesus, and we enjoy these things already now. Note in verse 4, he showed the glorious wealth of his kingdom. Now these blessings I refer, uh, refer to, you find in the book of Acts, for example, when Paul preaches the gospel, he refers to the fact that God, as the creator of God, has had always witness of the fact that he was a blessing God. That refers to these type, this type of blessings. You may read in 1 Timothy 4, at home you may study that, to see how God would use earthly blessings for his people to help them. In 1 Timothy 6 also, it's an important subject. How to see the earthly blessing in the right perspective coming from God's hand. All blessings we enjoy as coming from his hands. And then we see that <coughs> this feast was uh, given to all the people in verse 5 during seven days. And maybe even these seven days would refer to the seven millennia or seven dispensations of human history where we find that in all these different millennia and dispensations God wanted to bless the people in general. It's in the court of the garden of the king's palace. We find here, principle, this communion with the king is under his authority in the king's palace. God wanted to dwell with man, as we have already in Genesis 2 and 3, but man failed. We hope to see that later on. Just a few details about these blessings in verse 6. White speaks of purity, green, freshness, uh, blue, heavenly influences which are all given for our benefit and how come these blessings to us they were fastened with cords of business which would speak of fine fabric as you know and also of this purity and to me it speaks also of balance what we need is real balance and in this business I have a suggestion I see a suggestion of this balance of all these blessings God gives Purple would speak of God's kingly rights. It's in recognition of his kingly rights. Silver rings, you know, a ring would speak of relationship. But it is silver rings here, because all these blessings we enjoy now today is on the basis of redemption. Without the redemptive work of the Lord, we could not enjoy these blessings. Pillars would speak of testimony. God gives these blessings, it's a testimony for himself. It speaks of stability. In God's hands, these blessings are good, and all is stable. In the hands of man, all fails. White marble, uh, again, I think marble would speak of the basis upon which this all is placed, uh, purity and resurrection. Couches of gold, which speaks of rest and communion, but in connection with God's glory. The gold always speaks of God's glory. All here is in harmony with God's rights and God's glory. And only then there can be real rest and communion. And the silver, again, would bring in the value of the death of Christ. 
then upon the pavement of red and white marble, there's not only communion with God, on this basis there is also fellowship with one another. Pavement would speak of this. And red and white marble, you know, red speaks of love, white of this purity. And so, alabaster would speak of devotedness. Even in using these blessings, it is in true love, devotedness to our Creator God. It's very important to recognize our God as Creator. What we'll do in heaven even, you know, in Revelation 4, we are seen as creatures who bow down before the Creator and we give Him the glory. And then in chapter 5, we bow down for the Redeemer, the Lamb. We give Him the glory, but also the Creator. We will always be creatures and we will give glory to the Creator. White and black marble, I think it would speak also of the discernment which is needed. Even in using these blessings, we need discernment. Discernment between good and evil. Now in verse 7 we read, And they gave drink, they gave drink in vessels of gold. It's here to the glory of God. You know, wine is to satisfy God's heart, as we read in Judges 9. It rejoices man and God. So there again you see how God wants to have fellowship with his creatures in vessels of gold, honoring his glory. And then it says, the vessels being diverse one from another. That's another principle. You see in creation, variety. There is nothing which is merely repetition. And of course that is true also in redemption, that's true in the, in the church. There is not one vessel the same. Vessels would speak then of persons. There is no vessel the same. And we need all. That God may share these blessings, He need all His creatures. And so it is in the new creation. To share these blessings of the new creation, God needs all these vessels, that they may all be filled. Uh, then you read in verse 7 at the end, and royal wine in abundance. There is the abundance which is available. But again, it is royal wine. These blessings come from Him. And we enjoy them, recognizing his authority and we use them according to his instructions and according to his greatness according to the king's bounty there are no limits to these blessings and we may apply it also to the new creation there are no limits to the new creation and its blessings verse 8 and the drinking was according to commandment without constraint there's another important principle you know man and that's what we hope to see in verse 9 and onwards man has failed in using these blessings Man has introduced abuse or has gone into excesses in both ways. But here it says, For so the king had appointed to all the magnets in his house. It was under his leadership. But we see how man failed. They, they go into extremes, either to abuse these blessings or to uh, exclude them from all these blessings. Two extremes, but according to the Lord saw, there should be no constraint, no abuse and no force. You see how man, like you have the philosophers in Acts 17, you see how there were two extremes, the Epicureans and the Stoics. There are two extremes, and even today we might easily fall into extremes in connection with these things if you have in First Timothy 4. But notice now, provisions in abundance on God's side. But what does man do? Fails. That has been the sad history of mankind. We see it in Genesis 3. Eve and then Adam, they fell. They failed. We see it in the people of Israel. They had so many blessings. And the glory of God was even put upon them, as we have in Ezekiel 16. They failed. We see it in the older son in Luke 15. He wanted to have fun with his friends. He did not include his father with that, in that party. He wanted to exclude his father from that party. And so it is here, there was Vashti, who had all these blessings, who had a very special place, but she wanted to exclude the king from this. And so it has been in the history of the church, Revelation 2 and 3, you see, how the church has excluded the Lord, how the church has excluded God, how terrible this is. And what a contrast we hope to see in Esther, she made a feast for the king in Esther 5. She had a meal prepared for the king. And at the end of Esther we hope to see many lessons in connection with that. A feast for the king. And to enjoy with one another. Fellowship with one another will flow from that. We cannot have real fellowship with one another when God is excluded from this fellowship. 
We cannot even enjoy these earthly blessings when we in- exclude God from our thoughts. Family life, marriage life, a job, or earthly blessing, whatever, you name it. When we exclude God from these blessings, we will not really enjoy them, and we will dishonor Him. Now, what's going to happen here? Now, one word about Vashti. I think Vashti would also represent the Church as a testimony here on earth which has failed. We see in Romans 11 that Paul speaks about that. He speaks about the Jews and the nation of Israel. They have failed as a testimony for God. And then God has introduced the Gentiles to profit from these blessings. But then Paul says, you know, remark the mercy of God, but also how he would deal when you are unfaithful, how, would, how God would act. And that's what we find in this chapter. There was this unfaithfulness, and God could not accept it. There was much testimony on the side of God. You see in verses 10 and 11 how Vashti was invited by the seven chamberlains. The seven chamberlains would suggest this perfect testimony on God's part in connection with the place of the assembly. Vashti, special relation with God, especially a relation also with the Lord Jesus, but unfaithful, disobedient, rebellious, independent. And we see how the king cannot accept it. Also, I would mention the principle of idolatry. I think the moment God is excluded, idolatry is introduced, as we have in Revelation 2 and 3. Now, notice this perfect testimony God gave through the seven chamberlain. Um, we may apply it to the, again to the seven letters in, Roman, in Revelation 2 and 3. We might apply it also to the perfect testimony we have in the 14 epistles of Paul. Two times seven. The perfect testimony about the place of the assembly. But the assembly has failed. Verse 11. The assembly should be a testimony for God, but also towards this world. To show the peoples and the princes her beauty. She has failed. Like Israel in the past, the church now has failed. And you know, God introduces then a remnant. Now in our days, we might be such a remnant to answer to the desires of the king. And in the future, the, the faithful Jews will be a remnant to answer to the desires of the king. To in, indeed, to show her beauty. Now in verse 12, we see then how she refused how there was open rebellion, disobedience, how there was pride on her side, and all these features you find in the church. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11 that he was afraid that the church would not be this faithful witness, not be a chaste virgin. That's what happened here. She was not faithful. What's going to happen then in verse 13? We see how then the king would uh, consult with his wise man. And again, I think, here is a link with the book of Revelation. We find in Revelation the seven spirits. We know, of course, there is one spirit, and in connection with the unity of the body, we have one spirit, Ephesians 4. But, in connection with the testimony here on earth, we find in Revelation that this, the one spirit is presented as seven spirits. Seven lands, seven spirits. And here we find the seven princes, and also seven wise men who knew the times who were before the king as representing the seven spirits who maintained the Lord's rights who maintained the rights of the king and they gave advice to the king and then we come to the close of our uh, chapter the advice is that uh, Vashti should be set aside now that's the principle we have in Romans 11 because of the unfaithfulness of the church the church will be set aside and notice, it says in verse 19 at the end, Give her royal estate to another that is better sh- than she. The same as King Saul, when he was unfaithful, disobedient, Samuel said that God would give his kingdom to somebody who would be better than he was. That's the principle. And so we hope to see in Esther 2 that there is somebody who is responding to that call, who was really better than Vashti. But it might also be our desire to be better than what the testimony of the church was here on earth. To really respond to the desires of the king, to the, to the desires of our Lord. What is the real principle here in Vashti? It is principle of 
rebellion, of disobedience. And this is really what characterizes our days. And you know, therefore, these seven wise men, they give this advice. They do not only give an advice to the king that he should have another queen, but they see what is really at stake. They see that it is really a matter of authority which is at stake. And we are living in the days which, where the man of sin is coming soon on the scene, where this principle of disobedience and rebellion will be seen in its uh, highest phase. But we know this around already, uh, among ourselves and even around ourselves. We see how this principle of disobedience, this spirit, this attitude is rampant everywhere. A rejection of authority. Rejection of authority in the marriage relationship. Of authority in the family relationship. Rejection of authority in connection with the local assembly. You no, know, it is not so far away from us, this, prince, this problem. It's very close to us. And so how are we going to deal with this, with this problem? It's the only way is to follow the example of S. To have these, this condition we hope to see in S. That really is the answer to a spirit of disobedience. And we see how easily we uh, get acquainted with this attitude of disobedience. But you know, disobedience really is, in, is putting aside God's right. Because God has conferred authority to the husband, to the parents in relation to the children, to the local assembly. It is the Lord who has given that authority. And so when we reject that, we really stand up against God, like Vashti did here. And so this principle of authority is very important to maintain. And that is what the future remnant will do, and that is what we may do, as we find in Revelation 3 also. Now, does that mean that we should be tyrants and dictators? In verse 20 it says, All the wives shall give to their husbands honor, from the greatest to the least. So that is in connection with his authority. But it doesn't mean that the husband should uh, be despots and uh, tyrants. We see in uh, 1 Peter 3 that um, it says, Ye husbands, likewise dwell with them, with the wives, according to knowledge. It's an important principle, to know our wives, as with a weaker, even a female vessel, giving them honor. Now you would say, is that in harmony with this principle? I think both sides are important. Here in this chapter, it is a matter of authority. And when you would set aside that principle, you are always wrong. But that is one side of the coin. Here in Peter, we have the other side of the coin. The husband is to honor his wife. And so when both accept the place God has given, the wife accepts his authority, the husband accepts his place according to the Lord's mind, then we will prosper. We will be for the honor and glory of the Lord. And the same is true as we have in Ephesians 5, to love our wives. That does not set aside the principle of authority. Um, the, the same with the children. When they honor their parents, it's according to God's thoughts. Ephesians 6 is very important in connection with this. And so it is God-given authority which is maintained. In the right spirit, of course, in the right attitude. We are living in a day of crisis, of a crisis of authority and we see the serious consequences of this but there's always a remedy as we hope to see in Esther there's always a way to go on and to please the Lord to maintain the Lord's thoughts so in connection with Vashti we have seen he represents a collective um, testimony also collective testimony of the church and when the church has failed and will be set aside God will introduce another testimony, Israel. But what we see here, God is first to have this in a faithful remnant. A faithful remnant today, which might be a testimony of these truths. And it's so it's up to you and me to belong to a faithful testimony which honors the rights of the Lord. And so it will be a faithful testimony in the future, the, the, the faithful Jews represented in Esther, who will honor God and it will be a testimony of the rights of God in a world where his rights are rejected. That's so precious for the Lord. And so, may we get this benefit, this lesson from this, that in this book we hope to see that God wants to have a faithful testimony for himself.
God, in this book, God is going to act to introduce the man of his heart, Mordecai, who is going to be great, who is going to rule over the whole universe. But we know him already. And as we have seen in chapter 1, we recognize God and we honor God. And God wants to introduce us into the enjoyment of such a relationship where we honor him also as creatures in connection with the first creation. So we see in this book there are really many, many practical lessons. And in closing, uh, I would say this. When you would read through the whole book, try to follow these lines. To see on the one hand, God presented by Ahasuerus. How he is in control. And we should not uh, make the mistake and say, okay, but Ahasuerus as man was was uh, a failure. And that's true. He became easily very angry. He lost control of his emotions. But I'm speaking about the position he had. And as such, he represents God. And uh, as man, of course, he failed in many aspects. That's, that's true. But we see how, in chapter 3, we hope to see how the king represents God and how the king really is over everything and in control. Then we hope to see in Mordecai, the Lord Jesus, who came to suffer, and the Lord Jesus who was faithful here on earth, and the Lord Jesus who now glorified, we hope to see that in chapter 6, and how he will establish his authority in chapter 10. We hope to see the exercises of a faithful remnant as we have in Esther, the preparation in the school of God to become such a faithful remnant. And so there will be many lessons for us, because God wants us to be a faithful remnant. He wants to form us at his school, you know. So we gradually will see the place we have here on earth, also in connection with prayer. Although I mentioned prayer we do not find really in this book, but we will hope to see that there is lots of room for prayer, to for supplication, and then also that we will have a place in connection with the glory of the Lord Jesus to prepare things for him. We see, we will see in the end of the book how Esther prepared things really for Mordecai. So these lines, according to these lines, we hope to study this book and we hope to see then that although this book takes place in a time where there was no official relationship with the people as such, that God was working behind the scenes. And so it is today. God is in control. We might say, all has failed, and we might be desperate, but you know, this book is really an encouragement, and it's also an encouragement for our young people, because I'm sure that Esther was very young. It's an encouragement for brothers and sisters to take our place according to God's thought, even in connection with the first creation, but also in connection with His right, God's rights, and in connection with the Lord Jesus. So may the Lord help us when we meditate upon these li- according to these lines, and then the Lord will still leave us here to follow these lessons. I would close in reading one verse in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 24. These things took place in the days when this remnant was there, chastened by God. The fact that this remnant was in Babylon was chastisement on the part of God. But as we know, God chastises out of love. And we see in Jeremiah 24 that those who were in Babylon are compared with good figs, ripe and good. And those who rejected God's chastisement were compared with bad figs. You may read at home Jeremiah 24 and you will see that. And we see then in verse 7, I will give them a heart to know me, that I am Jehovah, and they shall be my people and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. You know, we are living in days of captivity too. The church as such is in captivity. Though uh, this faithful remnant, they were living in days of captivity. It was God's chastisement which was brought over them. But they accepted that. And so this is a lesson for us. When we accept God's chastisement, then we are going to be blessed. Then we are going to be like these good figs. And that's what we have in Esther and this remnant. They were like these good figs. They had accepted God's chastisement. And so God could bless them. 
when we exert God's dealings in his providence but especially also in his governmental dealings with us maybe even it expresses itself in illness or accident or loss of job or contrary uh, situations when we accept God's hand God's discipline we will be blessed and it's a matter of our heart for they shall return unto me with their whole heart they had accepted God's chastisement and their whole heart was now for God so may this verse also encourage us that our whole heart may go out to the Lord and accept his dealings with us his discipline our limits and there is so much to complain about but we shouldn't we should accept this as coming from God's hand and then seek to honor God as especially in that situation he is in control as we see in this book he allows these things and he wants to use these things for our benefit as we have in Romans 8 verse 28 that all things work together for the good of those who love God that's what we see in this book all things work together for us when we love him and so it's the matter really of our heart is my heart right before God what's the condition of my heart Solomon said my son give me your heart that's what we need to accept God's chastisement to accept God's dealings you have it also in Revelation 3 you know this faithful testimony this faithful remnant they had accepted God's chastisement you see it in the history of the church how God's chastisement came in and those who accept it they are going to be blessed so there is another lesson we find in this book and so may the Lord help us to enjoy these lessons and to put them into practice and enjoy what he has in mind for us. For his name's sake, amen.